Welcome to another uh, episode of Toronto Creative Podcast, where we talk to creative people in Toronto, share ideas to help each other out, and build a community. We have a very special guest today, Nadia Lloyd. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so Nadia, you're, uh, you, you, you're an artist, a designer, and also an event planner. And, uh, and, but this is not uh, something you started doing right off the bat professionally, um, which is why I'm very excited to talk to you today. You were a business owner, you owned a gym, and then suddenly you decided to become an artist. And you have been very successful. We'll talk about all your successes that you had through your face mask and like and all the uh, all the great stuff that you're doing. But why don't we go back to that? Like, how did you how did you get into being a personal trainer and owning a gym? Um, so I, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've been running businesses since I was like super little. I've always liked the idea of, of using my creativity to make money. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was in school in broadcasting in my late teens, and then I realized that in broadcasting, you're making like eight bucks an hour for 12 hours a day. Really? I, yeah, at first anyway, like you uh -huh. gotta work through the ranks, right? So where, where is, where'd you go to school? Centennial. And so by broadcasting, is it like radio and video, like uh, or radio, TV? Radio, television, television, broadcasting, yeah, okay. and film. Okay. Yeah, which, which my passion was in doing documentaries. So I love the idea of, 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 you know, having an idea you want to develop and, um, and film and doing the research and the whole productive side of it. So, so that's why I was in film, because I love that. And I had done uh, a couple of years working with TVO where I was working on documentaries with them. I was also hosting different shows, TVO French. Mm -hmm. um, so I went into broadcasting and then towards the end, after doing a couple of internships, I realized like, this is not gonna work out. I really don't wanna work 12 hours a day serving tea. Um, and when was this, if you don't want me asking? So 90, 1995 is when I started. 98 is when I graduated. So at this time, social media was not really no, no, a it thing, exist. right? No, it didn't, it didn't yeah, even okay. exist, no. Um, so, and then I'd heard, I'd started hearing about personal trainers, the concept of personal trainers. Um, so let me just rewind a, a little bit. I put on 15 pounds in my second year of college, so then I started working out. Mm. And I lost the weight, and I loved how I felt, and people were asking me to teach them, how, how did you do it, you know? So, so I, 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 that's when I thought, oh, I could be a personal trainer. And hearing what's, it, Personal training was really popular in the U.S., not really in Canada back mm -hmm. then. But hearing that, you know, personal trainers in the U.S. made like 30, 60, 200 bucks an hour, I was like, my, the entrepreneur in me thought, well, that's really attractive, right? I can work out, I can teach people how to get healthy, stay healthy, I only have to do a couple of, of hours a day and make a nice paycheck. So even before I graduated from film, I was already had like my foot in the fitness industry. And so... And I, are you, were you like, how did you learn to be a fitness... Um, a personal trainer? A personal I, trainer, Yes. Yeah. So I did it right when I finished Centennial. I started a program at Seneca mm -hmm. called Fitness Leadership. Okay. And then I got certified through different um, certification companies in Canada. So mm -hmm. I got certified and then I was able to start... Wow. Offering and, my services. And then you opened your gym soon after that? Or? Uh, so like nine years. So I, I did what every personal trainer does, right? I, I worked at the gyms. Um, I saw clients in their homes. Then I had a, a house in East York with a basement that I turned into a gym. So I kind of tried everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next logical step was to own my own gym. So um, I found a space uh, to rent in East York. And it was just going to be like my little studio for me and my clients because I had clients who were, who'd been following me everywhere for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and in that studio, I was going to have one nutritionist, one dietitian, one massage therapist. Oh, wow. So it's a full... Full, but it was going to be small scale. Mm -hmm. Within three months of opening, I had like 12 staff members and I could not keep up with the demand. Wow. Where was this in East York? East York, Cox, uh, Coxwell and O'Connor. It's still there. It's bad. called the Workout yeah, I, Lounge. I, 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 because I, Greek Town was like one of the places um, I grew up, I guess. But uh, okay. yeah, so that's that's great. So you like it just so took it off. So it's a eh? full fledged business within three months, and then I feel like I spent four years trying to catch up to it because it was really its own entity, and I was not in the business to own a full-fledged gym I just wanted my little studio mm. so I tried to keep up for years and then I just burnt out and after like three years I told my husband at the time I said I'm not renewing the lease I'm shutting it down and he's like he's like we're not shutting it down we're gonna sell it and I was like what do you mean we're gonna sell it and he's like Nadia it's a full-fledged profitable yeah, business I was say, yeah. so I was like okay sure enough we sold it yeah. <laughs> like 
six weeks later, we sold it in nice. February, and then the closing was in June. So in June, I handed the, the keys to the new owner. And uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping you, all your, I'm guessing all your hard work paid off. Like, oh, for sure, yeah. and it's still there. Is it? Is it it's like it's still a, there? It's still running as as the workout. Really, loft. it's one. It's called the work, work, workout loft. The workout loft. Nice. Yeah, it's won awards over the years. I was. I'm wondering, Nadia, why did like if it was like if the, if if it was getting too busy? Did you think about, or you may have already done it? Did you think about increasing the price? It, the money wasn't an issue. It was, it was profitable. The problem was it was my first time running such a large scale business. Yeah, I'm an introvert. Okay, so this is what I learned from that experience mm. is that I'm an introvert. I need like 90 hours or 90% of my time to be alone so I can recharge my battery. Mm. That business, I was surrounded by people from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. I was managing all sorts of staff. Some were great, some weren't. I was having to deal with a ton of clients, you know, mm. lots of great feedback, but we had, we had a couple of bullies that would come in there and just like try and... and so... I was so drained that now being in the same position now, I would know better and I would just hire a manager and separate myself from it. Back then I didn't know that. Back then I just said, you know what? I'm going through like a mental, emotional, uh, physical breakdown. Like I had this back injury that just kept coming back. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I just, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not having fun. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't care what happens to it. And I just, I want out. Mm. So, yeah. So in retrospect, I should have just hired a manager and walked away. But, you know, I sold it, put some money in my bank account, told myself and my husband at the time I'm taking a year sabbatical. I'm doing nothing for a whole year. You much deserved. <laughs> much deserved. Yeah. And I also didn't want to just jump into the next thing just to jump into the next thing. I didn't know what the next thing was. Right. I just sold my business. Like I just sold. And a successful business, too. Like it's not like you failed or anything. You no, sold a successful business. No, no, no. Yeah. It was all. Everything was great about it, except that I couldn't keep up and I was exhausted, exhausted. Um, and so, so what you do for one year? Well, it took six weeks before I started painting. So. <laughs> So, uh, I, Do you want to hear that story? Yeah, well, because that happened I, by accident. Yeah, well, yeah, that's I would I was I'm I'm interested because why painting? Why not? Okay, like so filming or photography? I don't know. Like, right? Yeah. So let me set the scene. It's I sell the business. We go away for a couple of weeks. We come back. My husband at the time was military, so he gets shipped off um, to Fredericton for like six weeks. So I'm on my own with literally nothing to do, and so I decided I would just like redecorate the house because we were flipping the house that we were living in at the time. Mm -hmm. So I started going to different winners, looking at stuff, furniture, home decor, accessories. Um, and I came across this beautiful painting. It's a landscape, abstract landscape. And I, and I saw it and I looked at the price. It was $39. And I thought, I'm not paying 39 bucks. too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> But then I went home and I could not stop thinking about this painting. So I said, you know, F it. What I'm, was that? What was the, it's just landscape? It's like, just a, yeah, I have it in my house right oh, now. Okay. Like I'll never, that, that thing is worth a million bucks now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, so the next day I said, no, I'm going to spend the 39 bucks. It's worth it. So I went back and I bought it, came home, put it on top of this like radiator. Um, and my husband had built a beautiful case for the radiator, like a wooden case. And mm. So this painting was really pretty on top of that. And then I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if I had two and I could hang one like upright and one upside down and it would just, I became obsessed with this painting and how I wanted it to look in this house that we were flipping. So husband's like, you got all the time in the world. Like here are the car keys, just do all the winners in Ontario if you have to, to find this duplicate, right? And so I did. I spent like two weeks where I went to like, I don't know, a dozen winners as far as like Brantford, Ontario. I would just just get in the car and go. Never found that other painting. And then one day Steve says, well, why don't Steve's you just... Steve's your husband? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you just replicate it? And I, I'm like, what? I'm like, I don't paint. What? He's like, I, I don't know. I think, I think you'd be able to figure it out. So I dismissed the idea. And then it would come back because I was like, oh, I'm bored. You know, I don't have anything to do. And he's like, go get some art supplies and try to replicate this painting. I was like, I don't know what makes you think I can paint. But like, no. And then, um, then one night he goes, it's a Friday night at like 8.30 p.m. He was due to leave again with the army the next day for a few weeks. 
he goes, grab your jacket. We're going for a drive. I said, where are we going? He's like, don't worry about it. Just grab your jacket. So we get in the car. We drive like five minutes to the art, art supply store on the day on fourth. I go, what are we doing here? He's like, it's for me. I'm buying myself art supplies. I was like, mm-hmm. Go in the store. He's picking out canvas. Like beginner set everything, apron, brushes, canvas, paints. I go, what are you doing? He goes, don't worry about it. It's for me. When I come back, I want to start painting. I was like, Steve, I'm not stupid. I know what you're doing. <laughs> so anyway, he buys this whole set, comes home, lays out all the equipment on the dining room table. Then the next day he leaves with the army and he's like, don't touch any of this. This is for me when I get back. And then, um, so now I'm at home alone for a few weeks and, and you know, I'm, every time I walk by the table, or anywhere I'm in the house, I can see all the supplies, right? So I, my brain starts getting intrigued. So I started going online and YouTubing painters and art. And then I quickly realized I loved abstract and I love watching artists paint abstract. So that, that's like innately what I was leaning towards was abstract. Um, and then eventually I went to the table, I put on the apron and I just kind of started doodling a little and everything was crap. So I'd be like, see, I, I knew I'm not good at this. I'd put it away, but then I'd go back to the videos. And it got to the point where literally I spent like eight hours a day watching videos of, of people painting because I could. I had no job. On YouTube? Yeah. Um, and on their websites, I'd like find these artists that I loved and, you know, would check them out. And then um, and at night I closed my eyes and I just saw colors. It was the weirdest thing. It was like my whole soul was immersed into this new thing that I was becoming passionate mm -hmm. about. And then I started painting a little more, painting a little more. And then my canvases started to grow and... Within six months, I had like a solid collection of abstract works. And back then, my preferred format was 24 by 48, so pretty big canvases. Um, and I was showing my dad and my sister pictures, and they're both fine art graduates. Oh, okay. And they were like, holy shit, now it's like, you're good. And I was like, oh, you're just saying so, that because I'm the baby of the family. So before before this, you have absolutely no... Zero. Like, so I'm like 30... Did you even take like painting years old. art never. in like high school? Never. Not even in never. like school? Never, never right? Never. Wow. Never. So I was 35. So you started at being an artist at, at 35. 35. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So my family started telling me these are good. So then I started... It gave me confidence to show them to other people. And then long story short, within six months... I put in an ad on Kijiji, and within a week, I'd sold like eight pieces, and I made, I don't know, $1,200, $1,500. Wow. Because I was selling them for like 150 each or something. Yeah. Um, so I just kept going, and then I started getting commissioned to, to paint different things, and then... Were you, uh, like, how did you, were you ad making, like, doing ads in Kijiji? Like, how did, how did people yeah, find you? Yeah, yeah, so I just... I, I figured, like, I've got all this art now, and it's getting expensive, right? Art supplies are expensive. So I'm just going to put a few on Kijiji and just say art for sale, as I'd seen other artists do on Kijiji. Mm -hmm. And then the phone started ringing. The first guy that came by walked away with two pieces. Then the next day, this couple was like, oh, we just flipped a house in Riverdale. We want, can we see these three pieces? But then they ended up buying five pieces, because wow. while they were at my house, they are like, can we see the rest? And they're you know, rummaging through my, my work and having it's amazing. A, yeah. Yeah. So and I was just having fun, right? I was creating these things. So I was like, I still have money in the bank. I got pregnant. Mm. A few months I started painting. So Your I'm first like, I'm, child. Yeah. So I'm growing my baby as I'm discovering this artistic side of myself. Nice. So it was a good year, right? I was just having fun and um but I'm thinking like people are calling me an artist and it just I was like there's no way. Like, it took me years to... to, to Can to, identify to, yeah. yourself as an artist? Yeah. And, and honestly, the, the day, the moment I had that aha, that, oh my God, I'm an artist, was the day that I acknowledged that for me, creativity is like oxygen. So, and I need to be creative every single day to feel good. So how did so, you, how did you come, come, come to that conclusion? Uh, just patterns, right? I realized that whether it was painting on a canvas or photography, because I do photography as well, mm, nice. um, or even something as small as editing a photo in, you know, on my iPhone, as like I need to be creative every single day, and so that to me is a definition of an artist: is someone who who has creativity running through their blood, 
and um, and it's it feeds their soul and it helps them manage stress and it helps them understand life and themselves and the world we live in and um, and you know I've been surrounded enough by people who are zero creative to know the difference to know that I'm like on another scale when it comes to creativity um, but it's like I need it I need it for my well being right. Oh, that's uh, that's fantastic. Because I always uh, explore the idea and idea about what 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 does it mean to be a creative. So so yeah, that's that's great what you mentioned. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Pleasure. Uh, what's uh, okay? So what's what happened after? How did you um, like? So you decided at this point, which it's been a year since you left your uh, gym. Yeah. And uh, at this point, you're selling art. What, what are you What are you thinking? Like, are you going to be pursuing art? Like, what what's going on in your mind? Yeah. Um, I knew I was gonna. It was gonna be a the the that side was going to be a lifelong thing because it it gave me so much in terms of like I mentioned dealing with stress improving just my well-being when it comes to living in life and mm -hmm. um and I and I really enjoyed that side of me that just explored with the art so there was no pressure no one was telling me what to yeah. do art is like a hundred percent mine and I and especially abstract I used to say all the time that I love ab abstract because there's no right or wrong there's no left or right there's no up or down I can create something and um, the art speaks to me as I'm creating it. Like it tells me what colors to pick, how to move the brush, what tools to use when it's done. And, you know, there's no such thing as a mistake because if I make a mistake, I just prime the whole thing white. Mm -hmm. So I loved, I really loved everything I was learning about life through my art. Right. And so life started to make sense for me because before that it didn't really because I have an abstract brain. And in this world of like everything needs to be in a box, people really don't like the abstract. I find people lack that go with the flow. Absolutely. Roll I, with the punches. Yeah. And, and that's where the magic is. Everyone wants to like they want to know what's happening at nine tomorrow at nine fifteen at nine eighteen. At nine. Uncertainty is something human beings are not like we were actually just talking about that. Like we were talking about like. Um, like religion, like for example, right? And we were talking about that with my friend and it's just like uncertainty is like, because uh, some people go crazy with it because they want to have, you know, they make their own versions of these all, all these things because they want to have the certainty. If I do this, I'm going to do this. If I do this, I'm exactly. going to do this. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so that's, it's, it's crazy that you learned uncertainty, dealing with, how to deal with uncertainty through art. Is that accurate? Would that, yeah, 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 because... Because there's no mistakes in art, there's only happy accidents. Now that I'm quoting Bob Ross here, but he's so right. <laughs> uh, but because I learned through just exploring with my art that, you know, I have I have like a dozen pieces. L let's say I've painted like 600 pieces in mm -hmm. the last 11 years. Wow. Let's say I don't even I don't know because I didn't count. But let's say give or take, yeah. Give or take, yeah. Um, I have like a, a dozen that I'll never sell. And I consider them masterpieces. And they most of them were painted in the first two years that I started painting. Mm. And it was literally like right brain, left brain, not at all involved, no judgment, literally just having fun and exploring. And I, I, I learned that, you know, that's where the magic happens, that I can trust my instinct because it's through my right brain instinct that I'm painting, right? It's not controlled. I don't set out unless it's like a commission and the client says I want a skyline mm -hmm. and I want these colors my own artwork from my from my own personal collection it's never I never go into the studio with any aspect of control and it always pays off so that's what it's taught me about life is that I don't need to control every aspect of everything I can let things flow I can just trust that the magic is happening and it's coming my way and then just watch it happen mm -hmm. versus telling the universe how to line it up because like that's so egotistical. I don't know better than the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that's very profound. Um, so before you, we get into your next next uh, step of being being an artist, um, what what would you tell? Like, what, I, I, you already touched on a lot of things here, Nadia. Like, if somebody wants to be an artist and like you know they're let's say they're a little bit older, they haven't studied art, what would your advice be for them? Well, the advice I always give because I hear. Too often I hear, oh, I don't have a creative, creative bone in my body, right? You, right? So many times. Like, what does that even mean? I, it means they don't think they're creative. But I say to them, we're all born creative. So my advice to you is to figure out what turns you on 
Is it music? Is it writing? Is it crocheting? Is it painting? Is it for taking photos? Whatever it is, figure out what turns you on and pursue that. And also, as I've learned, the more I create, the more I create. Meaning the more I create, the more I get this flow of creativity through me. And then it's just like, there's never a dry spell. I can't say it's the same for like writing a book or maybe, no, actually I can. Because even I go through like months where I don't paint at all. And then boom, I can do like, I've, I've had this annual tradition. I call it my marathon week or weekend. And it's like every year there's, there's um, usually in the spring, there's, there's like a, a weekend where, or maybe a day or two days where I will paint like seven to eight pieces and they are all stunning. Like I'm not tooting my own horn here. My art has a life of its no, own. No, no, I've I'm, seen your art. Yeah, they're, I'm, they're great. You know, I'm just I believe super you. grateful that <laughs> yeah. I'm the medium. Right. But I call that my painting marathon. So it's like when when the inspiration comes, like it's like bleh, it's like throwing up creativity <laughs> everywhere. It's like it's just. Yeah. And so, so does, is that, does that happen like uh, a specific time of the year? You mentioned spring. Yeah. So in the past, it's happened. In Do you the, see the trend like, you know, similar? It didn't happen this year. So I'm although we're still in spring we're still in spring yeah. <laughs> we're still in spring um do you have to like do you have a like a like a ritual or a routine that you do during this time or that kind I'm of i'm usually alone okay yeah so my son is usually with his dad okay and um when i feel the instinct when i feel like oh, oh i can feel it coming on i just make sure i have all the tools i need all the paint i need all the canvases i need because i'm usually not leaving my house for that period of time and i will have like four paintings on the go at once and I'll do, do a little bit here and then I'll do a little bit there and then I'll do a little bit here and then I'll come back here and then I'll, and it's all right brain. And then by the time I'm done, I am exhausted. It's like I've completely depleted myself of. It's kind of kinda like having a amazing workout, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah, it is. You know what it's like too? So it's, it's like a musician going into the studio and writing eight songs in a sitting, mm. right? It's, it, if you can allow yourself that, it, that time for that magic to happen as an artist, creativity does flow this way where someone will, 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 a writer will write a book in a weekend. An artist will write you know, eight songs in a weekend. A painter will paint eight paintings in a weekend. Um, there's no, and that's the thing. It's like, this is what I love about art again, is that there's no rules. Don't tell me what I can or cannot do. Don't tell me that because I'm a painter, I can't call myself a photographer either, right? And I just think back up on my friend's album. So I, I'm a singer too. And I create events. And, you know, I, I can, it, it's my own right to call myself, to label myself any which way I want. It's really no one, no one else's. Um, right to try to do that and you know people are shy about calling themselves an artist and I get it because I've been through it um, but it should never stop anyone from exploring what their creative passion and endeavors are yeah because that's a shame yeah no that is um, <clears throat> one of the things I do want to talk to you about um, was because you come from like sort of like a business you own your own business and then after that, you became an artist. And you did mention that at first, you were like, oh, can I call myself an artist? You even had that doubt. Oh, for sure. And, uh, and I, I had that doubt as well. I come from like a banking background. Um, so I, I want to I wanna hear uh, your thoughts on this. Like, why do people feel that way about becoming an artist? And I've noticed that, Nadia, like when I, when I go somewhere, like let's say I, I'm, I'm shooting an event, right? Or like I'm doing, a, I'm, 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 at a, I'm at a photo gig. And people start chatting up to me like, how long have you been doing this, this and that? And I tell them, oh, well, I'm not like, you know, not too long. I haven't been doing it all my life. I don't have that story that, oh, my somebody got me a camera when I was a teenager. Yeah. You know, every I, I don't have that story. Yeah. We did steal a camera from our high school, <laughs> but, but that was a different story. <laughs> but uh, but but yeah, like so. So when I tell them that I, I was to work in banking, the right away I, I can see in their body language, like they're like, oh, like, you know, I'm oh now you're more respectful. Like, you know, like, yeah. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, you know, there's, there's, there's this tone change, like, yeah. you know, and I've done like a few events and even weddings. Like, you know, I've, I've noticed how people, when they find out about my background as a, as, as a different industry, other than artist, they, they change their tone completely the way they treat me. And, and because of that, I think, and also because like everyone's scared and I was scared too, to become an artist. And I think it's because our society kind of beats down 
uh, on the notion that uh, like becoming an artist is a lesser profession, as I was telling you before. Do you believe that? And if so, why do you think that is? So interestingly enough, I have to say my experience is opposite. Mm. Uh, and maybe it's also, maybe I'm projecting because I've always thought of artists as like, that's the ultimate goal in life, man. If you can like, someone who calls themselves an artist, they are truly, truly living their best life. Whether they have the bank account to show it or not, they're truly living their best life, right? Mm. They're pursuing their Absolutely. own. Absolutely. Right? And so, and that's why for me, it was like, I thought, me an artist? Like, it just took me a long time to, to, be, to be like, damn it, yes. You know, and now when people say, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm an artist. And they're like, yeah, but what do you do? Right? And I'm like, I'm an artist. Like, I'm a full-time <laughs> artist. I do whatever I want. And I, I'm creative. And that's, you know, so then I break it down. But yeah, so for me, it was always more like a privilege and an honor. I believe that. You I know believe what I mean? that. Yeah. But do you think our society believes that? So... I'm going to say our society is cautious because of things like starving artists. There's no, th why, how come there's no starving engineers? <laughs> I think it's historically they, they well, make good money. Like starving doctors. I don't really know starving doctors. Like, you know, like how about unhappy engineer? Yes. Suicidal dentist. Yes. Like, you know, dentists have the highest. We should start this trend. Yeah, you know. So I think, I, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, so it's sorry to cut you off, but you, you know mentioned it. You know what it is too? What? Like every parent except me. I tell my son, I'm like, yo, you see how I'm living? <laughs> nine to five is not gonna get you that kiddo some days he's like do you even work i'm like a little i'm like nine to five is not gonna give no. you this lifestyle right so but a lot of parents like my parents included you need to be a doctor you need to be an engineer you need to be an architect you need to be a, you know so yeah who's who who's telling their kid be an artist when you grow up right because yeah. there's all this these, why aren't we doing that is it because you mentioned starving artists I think, I think that's what it is i think that's what it is but it's not true it well, so I'm going to say yes or no, right? Because I have, I've had a good run of hustle years of like having to borrow money to pay my rent. As an artist? Yeah. As a, yeah. Art, so artist and event planner, right? Which, which mm. I started doing afterwards. But, just, but I believed in myself and I knew something was going to happen that was going to put my name on the map. And like, I knew I just had to keep going. So, and, and people would say to me, like, my, I have a sister who'd be like, dude, man, just get a job. I was like, get a job? What, what does that even mean? Like, where? McDonald's? Pumping gas? Like, where? A job? At 40? Just get a job? Like, no, I'm building something right now. Like, yeah, it's not easy, but I'm building something I believe in, right? So, yeah. So, it's, I think that's what it is. is parents don't want their kids to suffer, and then, you know... You know, every artist needs that big break, right? Mm -hmm. Well, not well. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah. Not every artist needs. You can like, still make a living without making a big. A hundred percent. Yeah. But a big break and some sort of recognition that puts you on the map is really an amazing, incredible thing for an artist. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. To to have their creativity and work like seen by the masses and appreciated by the masses is a beautiful thing. But yeah, I mean, I've been hustling most of my, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, um, what's the word? Like, I'm not shy to hustling. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and when you're hustling for something that you love, it makes it more enjoyable. For sure. I mean, that's, that's like, a, that's not even hustle for me. It's like, I'm loving, I no, love doing it. No, it's not a like, hustle. It's being true to yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. So you mentioned you have a, you have a son. Yeah. Because uh, I'm curious, like what if, obviously you probably, if he says, mom, I want to be an artist. Oh, I'm all, all the time. I'm like, come, I'll show you everything I what, know. What is? How old is he? He's he, he's gonna be twelve this summer. So, how, what is what is it like? He, does he talk he about loves, being? No, he he loves gaming and Legos. Uh, he loves. So maybe he's into computers more. <laughs> maybe, and you know what? I'm not I'm not gonna shove anything down his throat. Um, what I have, uh, he's he's seen me be creative. He's seen me paint. Him and I designed the the BLM mask and yes. the Raptors wore. So, yes. he's he has. He owns a chunk of that success story mm. and how, how amazing it felt, right? Um, he sees how I live. Like, I don't 9 to 5. I can pick you up from school at 2.30. We can, you know, we, we can take um, vacations. I don't have to ask my boss for time off. Like, he sees the perks of, of self-employment mm -hmm. and of, of the creative lifestyle. 
Um, but yeah, he's in grade six and he's just enjoying life right now. So it's, you know. Good stuff. All right. So let's get back into your career path as an artist. Um, <clears throat> um, so like you mentioned, um, I think we stopped at where you started selling all your pieces. It's been a year since you sold your sold your gym. And uh, okay, so what's so how did this uh, and what's happening next? How, t- t- talk to us about the math. Sure. Okay. So actually, so about a year after I started painting, the entrepreneur side in me realized that a lot of people were saying, oh, I love your work, but it's too, you know, I can't afford it or I don't have a wall to put it on, um, but I love your work. And so I started thinking, I wonder how I can make my art more functional and affordable and accessible. Mm. So within a year, a year and a half, I started printing my art on different fabrics and doing different things. How did you come about that idea? Um, Just wanting to be able to get my art out there Mm -hmm. without it having to be on a canvas and cost 800 bucks. Mm. So, for example, the hoodie I'm wearing right now, right? That's my hoodie from my collection. So You painted that? So this is actually a photo. Oh. It's a digital photo that I digi- digitally manipulated in, mm-hmm. in Adobe. And then I have a, a whole collection of products featuring the skyline. Um, and so this started in 2013, let's say, mm-hmm. and grew. So I would say I became an artist in 2010 is when I picked up the brush. 2011, 2012, I became a designer because that's when I started printing my art and doing scarves, skirts. Um, and did you just, uh, <clears throat> uh, like, who's printing them? Like, do you have a, like, yeah, a I just, vendor relationship? You know like, what? I mm. just did some research online. I had a couple of guys in Asia printing a couple of things. I found a company in Montreal that printed a couple of things. Most of these are, were printed on Queen Street West. My guy left during COVID. <laughs> The guy who was printing that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> He's in Texas now. But anyway, um, you know, I've, I've, I, I started just doing research and development, looking online and finding people to print my stuff. And mm. so, um, so... And I, then how are you... Uh, like, are you selling them through your website? At yeah. The, I mean, at that time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. social media. Um, okay. I would say both. Um, and I... Like, I... My husband at the time and I built myself a website within the first year of painting. Mm. Uh, it was just like an on- online gallery. And then when I started designing products, then we we added like another shop component to the website. And then in 2006, I actually just like threw that website out the window and got myself a Shopify website. Mm. And that's, Shopify's that's, great. Yeah, yeah, it's so, so like everything under one roof, especially for someone who's not tech savvy like me. Um, and then uh, in 2017, um, no, 2016, Tourism Toronto, uh, approached me one day and they said we want to we want you to design our uniforms mm. um so that was like really cool for a self-taught designer to be like how do you uh, i'm curious nadia how do you um how do you know how to price these different clients yeah you know what big learning curve and uh, it's always a struggle for oh, me. oh like, for sure so i would say like you have to lean on friends or people you mentors who are doing the same thing and and don't be shy to ask them mm. So I did that, um, you know, and my my parents had a manufacturer when I was a kid. So my mom designed children's clothing. My dad ran the factory and they they would supply like Eaton's and Bay and Sears. And, oh, wow. Yeah. So I kind of was in the okay. m- manufacturing of clothing business as a kid. OK. So I had a little bit of background there and and the rest was just like logic. I was like, OK, it's cost me this much to make this item. Um, you know, ideally, I want to make this much profit. Or if you're deal- dealing with retail, then then there are rules that you have to follow, if, mm-hmm. and it cuts into your margin. What about like copyright and things like that? But again, research. Mm. Again, research. Um, even actually got scary because as I was growing and growing and growing, and like the CN Tower w- was selling some of my products in their gift shop. Oh wow! Then the AGO started selling my products in the gift shop. And, and they then, were giving you a cut, like obviously, or oh yeah, because they were like I was one of their wholesale. Yeah. Now they they put an order, and I would you know uh, fulfill the order, and then mm-hmm. they would sell my stuff. Uh, but then one day I come across a blog to article that says the CN Tower is about to like sue anyone who's who's got a design featuring the tower. I was like, what? Really? <laughs> How's that gonna work? <laughs> I think they realized that was a dumb idea. Plus, like. I was becoming known for like the girl who was putting the CN Tower on the map all over the world. Basically, yeah, it is a dumb idea. How can you do that? Tourism Toronto was wearing my uniforms everywhere. The main feature on all of my designs is the tower. <laughs> they were buying my gifts to give to dignitaries. The Pearson International started buying my products to give as gifts. And so it was like, how are you going to... Like, I'm 
helping promote Toronto and mm. the C and, and the CN Tower number one because that's my muse, right? So anyway, they dropped. But then that, that, that could I'm, I'm thinking like that could get into Marky Waters like. For example, like, because it's such an icon. It's like Eiffel Tower. Like, there's, like, key chains well, with the thing. CN are Tower. You, like, are well, you're going to sue everyone? Yeah, you're going to sue, like, a street vendor selling CN Tower keychain? Well, because it's, like... That's, you'll have to go to, like, 3,000 factories in China yeah, and, like, and, how are you and gonna sue them all down because all the, most of that stuff is coming from Yeah, them, that doesn't right? make any sense. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they, they gave up on that, but it was, like... Did they, uh, did they like, did you, like, uh, how, how long did they pursue? Did, they, did, they, did you get a letter or a call? No, or no, no, they never did. I just kind of, like... Made myself little for a minute, you know. Staying low, okay. Yeah. <laughs> low, even though my products were literally in their basement, in their like main floor gift shop. Um, but yeah, so that's the thing, right? Like, I, I I've been, I've been um, resourceful in in a sense that when I'm interested interested in something, like, and when it's a passion, it's really easy for me to just get lost and spend hours putting in the work, right? Mm. So. All that stuff. I didn't go to school in design, right? I had to teach myself all that stuff and uh, take a lot of chances. And, you know, some paid, some cost. Some mistakes cost me money, but whatever. I was like, it's cool. I'm yeah, just that's the, keep going. That's the wonderful thing about the journey, right? Like you learn. From totally. Mistakes, and you know. I don't have a boss. I haven't had a boss in 15 years, right? Yeah. So. Uh, I can yeah it's 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 amazing not having a boss. <laughs> oh my god, it's the best feeling ever. So so 2016 um, so you started selling your fabrics and other <clears throat> other other different fashion uh, other accessories services. home decor. So yeah. what's what, what happened after that? How did you I'm I'm curious like the 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 mask can, can you tell the us mask, the story? How sure. did you come across that? Sure sure. So uh, March 2020 and the whole world shut down. The whole world shut down, yeah. Um, right away I went on Amazon and ordered uh, medical masks because I knew we were gonna have to wear them even mm. though the government was like we don't don't worry about it it's only for yeah I remember frontline. in the beginning they were flip flopping a they, little bit about yeah the and mask, they, they right? kept saying like, don't worry but you don't have to but then after a few months they're like yeah now you have to wear after a few months yeah and yeah. in fact it took till July seventh of mm. twenty twenty for Mayor Tory to make it like mandatory that you have to wear a face mask indoors right mm -hmm. so it still took like four or five months but right away I I figured well we're gonna have to wear them plus I live in a condo. Um, and uh, so we were all at home. My kids' school got shut down, right? We were at home for weeks, and we like to go for walks. And so that's why I ordered the mask, but it was going to take three weeks for us to get them. And then one day I'm sitting in the kitchen, and I could see my couch. And under my couch, I had two big Tupperware bins full of cushion covers mm -hmm. with my art. So I saw, the, I saw them, and I was like, I said to my son, I was like, hey, Felix, let's, um, let's have a little Sunday project. Like, let's grab some cushion covers and cut them up, and let's sew some face masks. Um, for ourselves and see what happens, right? So that's what we did. We used, um, it was like a skyline um, print. Cut it up, sewed it up by hand, man. It like, like I, I, I don't know where they are. I wish, I'm, I know I'm going to find them one day, but they were like a joke. <laughs> what like, were you, what sewn, was it? Right? What, what were you, like, what were you sewing? Like, what was the design? Fa it was, it was just like a face mask with elastics. Oh, you, you're just kind of making face masks yeah, yeah, from we, scratch. We made just for him and I, but by oh, hand, because okay, I didn't okay. even have a sewing machine. Oh, so, okay. so we did it by hand and then we put them on and we went for a walk to the CN Tower, took some photos when we came back, posted the photos on social media um, and like right away, people started saying, can, "Can I buy? Can I buy this? Can I buy this?" And I was like, "No." I was like, this "Wait, is... the mask with the CN Tower?" Yeah. So we you made the mask, and then you went to CN Tower, took some pictures. Yeah. And then you put posted those pictures the photo on Instagram and, on the mask uh, of me wearing my mask. Uh, where did the CN Tower come from? So it was on the fabric. So 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 it's like I take the sweater, yeah. and I cut this piece out, and, and with this put, rectangle, okay, gotcha. I make a face mask. And right? then people, so, yeah. Yeah. So people are like, "Where can I buy this?" And I was like. I was like, don't worry about it. The, this is only gonna last a few weeks. Like, you don't. I'm, this is not a business, first of all. So it's it's all good. You'll be okay. Um, but then I started getting emails and DMs from doctors and nurses, and they were saying, "Hey, we're like in desperate need of fabric masks that we can wear over our N95s because we're given one N95 and it has to last a week. So we need face masks so we can like double up the protection so we can get more life out of these N95s. Is there any way you can help us out?" Um, and I thought, yeah, I'd love to help out because uh, I'm bored and I'd rather keep busy than to sit here and worry about the fact that both of my streams of income have completely dried up. The, the city has shut down all my events, so no money coming in there. No one's buying art. Mm -hmm. 
So I was like, yeah, I need to keep busy so I can stay in the right mindset, stay positive and feel like I'm helping. Mm -hmm. Right. So I put the word out on my, uh, on the Liberty Village Facebook group. I was like, I need a sewing machine because I know how to sew because I'd learned when I was a kid. I need a sewing machine. Sure enough, someone in my building was like, I got one. You can come and get it. And so I started sewing right away and I started like donating 40 to 60 face masks a week. Um, wow. Yeah. And people were still asking to buy, but I was like, no, I'm not selling. I'm just donations, donations. But then after like four weeks, I realized that the face masks were not going away. People were still asking to buy and I was starting to run out of these cushion covers to recycle. Um, and I had to start, I was starting to like order um, supplies on Amazon, like elastics and thread and, mm -hmm. and this and that. And so I thought, okay, well now I have to start spending money. I haven't made a, I've been on CERB for six weeks, mm -hmm. just enough to pay my rent and buy food. I don't have enough money to buy supplies to give away. So now I'm going to start selling them. So I put out the word that I was now selling them. And for each one I sold, I'd make a, a donate one. And then within like 24 hours, I had 48 orders. Within 24 hours? Yeah. Because wow. people, but people were like, that's how that's yeah, they were to get At their the time, hands, the right? mask, yeah. And it's a, and it, 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 a lot of people wanted a fashionable, like a cool mask. Yeah. And the CN Tower, right? So all the people who knew my work already were like, oh man, this is so cool. Yeah. So I started selling and then, um, then I re so now we're in like April, mid April, let's say close to like probably this time of year, close to May. And I'm realizing, okay, so now I'm, I'm now I want to design, I, I want to put, I want to design design specifically for face masks. Um, and so the first one I decided to do was the pride mask with the Toronto skyline because pride was going to be in June. Mm. So I designed it, but there was no pride that year. There was no pride, but I figured that's one way we can still celebrate, mm, right? Okay. So I designed it, um, sent it off to print. Then the fabric came back three weeks later. I was so excited. I remember like opening the box like it's Christmas, cut it up, sew the first one, put it on. Again, I do a little video on, on Instagram, and then I get a DM, and it says, uh, Hi, this is so-and-so from the mayor's office. We've been looking for a pride mask wow. for John Tory. And we've been following you on Instagram because of your love for Toronto. And um, we would love to order a couple. Can we come and pick them up? Because we're having some issues with our shipping and receiving. So I said, sure, here's my number. So they called me that afternoon and said, we're here. And I went down thinking it was going to be like an assistant. And Mayor Tory is no. right there. He came to pick it up. <laughs> he, he, he was sitting down. So when he saw me come along, he stood up and he said, are you Nadia Lloyd? And I said, yeah. He's like, I'm Mayor John Tory. I'm like, I know who you are. I just saw you on TV five minutes ago. <laughs> And he goes, I just wanted to come and meet you and tell you how much I love your work. And I, you know, I saw your website and love everything that you're doing to, to show the beauty of Toronto. And it's not the last you'll hear from me. I'll be talking about you to the media. And he did. eh? Oh, my God. He like he literally. Well, first of all, he literally spent a year and a half just primarily wearing my face mask. Mm -hmm. I think I only saw him wear. I think I saw him wearing that mask. He wore them all. He wore my my pride a lot. And then I designed a Canada Day one for him. Mm. And it was very, I'm very last minute. <laughs> like, it was like three days for a Canada Day and I messaged his office. And I'm like, I've got a mask that, 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 um, that uh, was inspired by John Tory for Canada Day. And then they, they reply, oh, we've already selected his three masks for that day, but we'll come pick it up just in case. He, he started his day at breakfast television wearing my mask, wearing it, and then saying to the camera, you see this mask I'm wearing? This is an artist named Natty Lloyd, and you need to check her out at nattylloyd.com, and she does amazing work. And then he basically wore my Canada Day mask all day, and then for five months afterwards, like, he just... He was my biggest fan. Yeah. He's, I also, like, you know, I don't want to get into politics, but I thought he was a great mayor. Oh, me too. Uh, yeah, he did. He me does the way he navigated through the pandemic and how he helped how, small businesses. And how hard uh, he worked. I saw how hard it worked, and uh, he was He, he was, was just amazing. He was nonstop. He was yeah. not. And he would, like, still find the time. He left me a, a voicemail. I still have it here for my birthday. No way. Yeah, because my birthday was, actually, my birthday was that, so we, he came to my house to get the mask on the Friday. My birthday was the Sunday. On the Sunday, I was at the beach with friends, and I saw, I missed the call when I got home. I, I checked my messages, and it's like, hi, Nadia, this is Mayor John Torre. just wanted to you wish you a call happy from the birthday. Mayor. Oh, amazing. <laughs> you missed a call from the mayor. I missed a call from the mayor. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. This is amazing. I, I, you have uh, this amazing uh, strength and quality and idea of kind of navigating 
different channels for your art and without even having a background with it. And um, I'm curious before we go uh, any further on your uh, career, like how do you how do you get the confidence in you to do that? Like it's just like I feel like you're like okay, I you have that amazing confidence. It's like, okay, this is something I can do and I'll do it, and you just go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, like is that is that something innate? It's, is that something? It's innate. Yeah, it's you think there's something like I've been like that like, since I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't taught. It was just I just have this fire in my personality, mm. and uh, the older I get and the more I experience life and also loss. I lost my brother, and my dad. Sorry the more I I experience loss, the more I realize how finite our time he, here is. So the more I'm I'm even more of a go getter, if that makes sense. Because I'm like. I ain't got time to wait. Ain't nobody got time for this. If I can visualize something, I know I can make it happen, right? So, um, so I just charge through, and I don't let anything stop me. Like I don't really have bad days anymore. I don't, uh, and I mean, th th there there is shit that could make my days bad, but it's a mindset. It's more like me. I'm in the mindset that, you know, life is short and it's awesome and I love what I've accomplished and what, like, blessings life has given me and my son and, mm -hmm. and I believe there are more around the corner and I'm so excited, right? So even, I'd say, like, I'm even more on fire now than I've ever been. Wow. Uh, but I also don't do anything unless it's an inspired action. So the universe and I chat all the time, right? So it's like... Anything that I want to pursue, until it's a hell yes, it's a hell no. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't waste my time like dilly-dallying with anything. It's like if I'm doing something, it's because I believe in it and I know it's going to succeed. If I'm just, you know, vegging on the couch, Netflixing 12 hours straight, it's because that's what I need and nothing else matters right now but my self-care. I self do that care. all the time. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think I just like, but from, from Friday night to now... I slept something like 20 hours. That's good. You need something. I was burnt out that. last week. I just yeah. needed it. So. No, absolutely. Um, do you have any, I'm curious, do you have any, uh, like, uh, like, how do you, it seems like you're the kind of person who doesn't need motivation, but I was going to ask you, like, do you, how do you stay driven and motivated? Do you have any, anything you do on a regular basis, any routines? Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. So like, self-care. Mm -hmm. But what's, what, what's self-care? So self-care is whatever I need. Right. And it's like, now I know I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. Now I know that hanging out with the wrong person is draining. Mm -hmm. So I don't do any of that. Um, I own my schedule. The only person, my only boss is my kid. I call it, I call him jefe, which means manager <laughs> yeah. in Spanish. His schedule is my schedule. Right. So I co-parent, which is great for me because it means that when I'm with him, it's just him and I one-on-one -on -one for a whole week. And then when he's with his dad, I can just take care of my needs mm -hmm. for a whole week. Mm -hmm. But I need that. I need that for my creativity. I need that for my relaxation so I can be creative. Um, I, I need that so I can be inspired. Because sometimes when, you're, when I'm surrounded by people talking all the time, I can't hear. It's not that I can't hear in my head, but I can't, you know, the universe is feeding me inspiration. And I'm, I'm missing messages because it's just too noisy. Like, I can't be overstimulated. That's what it is. I need a lot of downtime. I know that about myself what do you What do you do on your downtime? I work out. I sleep. I travel on my own. I love to travel on my own. Mm. Um, I paint or I do creative things. Um, sometimes it's as simple as going out for a walk by the water. Nice. Now, that's, that's beautiful. A lot of people underestimate the power of those things oh yeah um, it's everything man yeah. it's like baseline for me baseline yeah i, I try i eat well yeah no that's uh i i believe you that's just that yeah those things are very important so i guess so from there you have you now you created the mass for john john tory and then i guess after george floyd happened and then the raptors and then the raptors so let's talk about that how did you so so george floyd was murdered may 26th May 25th or 26th, I'm pretty sure it's 26th. And th was that 2020 or 2021? 2020. 2020, right? 20. Okay. It all kind of happened all at once. So it's like, like really, fa like March, everything shut down. Yeah. And then within two months, this happened. Yep. So the whole world is at home watching these visuals and hearing these things, right? And mm -hmm. like, n none of us know what the hell's going on. And, and it's like the stress levels are so high and the fear and the, you know, it's it was like a weird time. Yeah, it's very weird. Um, so for me, when when George Floyd was murdered... I found myself 
spending the next couple of weeks feeling really down. And it took me a while to, to figure out why, but now I understand. Like, so I, I was reliving a lot of the racism I've um, experienced. And, and I knew I had to have a really important chat with my son also about what had happened because he was about to go spend a week at his grandma. And, um, and I knew he was going to come across images, maybe like on the you know, cover of a newspaper. He would, they listened to the radio a lot, his grandparents, so he would hear things. And I knew I had to have a conversation. And we had talked about racism and bullying. And, but I knew I had to have like a real like sit down. I'm going to share what I've been through in my life, what my parents have been through because they were a multi, a biracial couple. Um, so anyway, so for two weeks, I was feeling kind of stressed out and blue. And then... I had that, sat him down and had that conversation with him one day. And, and the kids were so awesome. He was like, why are you nervous to talk about this? Like, we've talked about it before. And I was like, you're so right. It was all in my head. I needed to process it, right? But we had a really good conversation. And at the end of the conversation, to this day, neither of us remembers who, but one of us said we should design a mask that will encourage people to have conversations about racism and discrimination. And that same day, I grabbed the laptop out and we looked at, we looked at some of the art and we put together this design of like the black, white, and gray, the Toronto skyline with the fist of solidarity behind the CN Tower, sent it to print. And um, then, you know, again, like three weeks later, the fabric came in, I sewed the first mask. And, and I remember I was in my studio and I was, I remember like holding the mask in my hand and literally thinking like, I'm getting goosebumps right now, just reliving it, but literally thinking, I can't wait to see what you're going to accomplish talking to my mask mm -hmm. <laughs> and feeling so proud that my, this is like a collab between me and my 10 year old mm -hmm. at the time. How, and plus how it's cool such a, that, like a great right? cause. Yeah. Yeah. So then right then and there I decided, okay, I'm going to give $5 to BLM Toronto of every mask sold. And then um, I grabbed my phone and I was scrolling through Facebook. And then I came across uh, a blog to article that talked about, or that showed a photo of the new buses in the NBA bubble in Florida. So the Raptors had unveiled the new buses that said Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. I remember that, in, yeah. In large letters, right? Yeah. Took up the whole side of the bus. Yeah. So now I'm like, I'm looking at the, the bus and I'm looking at my mask and I'm like, oh my God. It's like perfect. I have perfect to get, marriage, yeah. yeah, I have to get um, this mask to the Raptors. Like I'll, and then the idea just came quickly together. It's like, I'm going to donate one to every player and to management. And then, you know, hopefully I get like one picture of like one player wearing it. And then boom, I can really um, raise some funds for BLM Toronto. So I went on the Liberty Village Facebook page, which is where I live. They all know me as an artist. They all seen that I was making the face mask. Most of them knew that Mayor Tori was now wearing my work. And so I, 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 I showed a picture of the mask in the bus and I said, guys, I've, this is like my latest design. I want to raise funds for BLM Toronto. Can anyone put me in touch with anyone at the Raptors? And then I put away the phone and I went back to sewing. And then two hours later, I grabbed the phone and the, the post had had a lot of traction. Uh, a lot of a lot of people wanting to help, right? That, that's the one thing I learned about that era in life, that COVID era, is like people were like, you need a sewing machine here, you need thread here, you need elastic here. Like everybody wanted a sense of community. Absolutely, yeah. Just to survive the uncertainty and the strangeness, right? Um, so this 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 post, yeah, people were like, oh, my cousin's uncle's neighbor's sister's cousin sweeps the floor at the ACC. I'll try to get you in touch with them. Like that's the kind of <laughs> that's the kind of stuff I got. And, and there were so many messages of people saying, I know this person, I know that, that person. But one of them had 19 likes. And the name was Roberta Nurse. And I, I saw that, and I thought, Roberta Nurse? I was like, could she be related to Nick Nurse? She was. And I remember like taking a moment, putting the phone down, and just feeling like, oh my god, like shit. Like, pardon my English, but. So I click on the message. Sure enough. Hi, Nadia. This is Roberta Nurse. I'm Nick Nurse's wife. Whoa. <laughs> Nick and I love your art. Um, it's not the first time we've seen it. Um, we love the fact that you're a black female entrepreneur, single mom, and there's no way that we're taking a donation. We want to put an order for 35. Here's my phone number. Call me so we can work out the details wow. of the order. Yeah. This is the strength of social media. Yeah. You know, as yeah. much as like people say like negative things. Well, that's this the is, thing. That's the thing. I think it is yeah. what you make out of it. A hundred percent. You like got to learn to use it. Exactly. And, and, and you got to be careful that you're not using it just to feel like a sense of validation for your existence. <laughs> do you it's, know what I mean? Yeah, I could even, if that's what majority of the people do, and I can't even fathom, why would you do that? 
Like, if it's gone tomorrow, like, yeah. how could you? Like, anyway, that's yeah. a different separate conversation. Yeah. So and then what happened? And then you end up selling to her, right? Yeah. 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 So, I, so I call her and then um, her and I chat and I said it's going to take me a few weeks because I've got to get the right sizes done because mm -hmm. these basketball players are not like standard yeah, they're size. Huge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? So I got to make sure it's the right size. And anyway, so she's like, okay, cool, cool. Fast forward a few weeks and then um, I delivered on a Thursday when I, my son and I went to her house. And, and delivered the box, and she was going to ship it to the bubble, the NBA bubble. And then she goes, oh, I was on the phone with Nick today. And he was like, Have, has she dropped them off yet? He can't wait to get them. And, and like, he promised, you know, even if you don't get a photo of any of the players, like, he will wear it a couple times and get you some good photos so that you can raise funds. Cool, cool, cool. And then fast forward Monday evening, she sends me a text, and she goes, um, Nick and Fred Van Vliet are about to uh, do a virtual conference, and they're both wearing your mask. And before I know it, I go on Twitter, and my Twitter had like exploded because um, Blake Murphy, who I think is a, a writer mm -hmm. for the NBA, had posted a photo of Nick and Fred in my face mask and said, all he said was mask via Nighty Lloyd. And my Twitter blew up. And that very night, it was like, um, who was it again? Like Sportsnet, TSN, Toronto Star, Globe and Mail, Financial Post, um, CTV e-talk i basically spent that week doing media interviews amazing and trying to fulfill orders at the same time and then um and then uh donovan bennett from um sportsnet then reached out and said uh, we want to do a feature on you and your work so we would be coming to your studio if you're okay we'll all be masked because it was like super heavy yeah. covid protocols we want to come to your studio and do, I can't remember if it was a one or two day shoot, um, but it's going to air during a Raptors game. So I had, geez, how do you say no to that, right? So they came to my house, uh, to my studio sometime in August, and then that five and a half minutes aired during game six of the NBA playoffs, September 6th, 2020. And like out of body experience sitting there. They were all wearing like every all the Raptors were wearing. No, so what happened is since since that time that Fred Van Vliet and, and Nick wore my mask, Nick only wore my masks mm. exclusively. And then I would see I would get tagged on photos of other players wearing my masks here and there. Um, and Matt Devlin would say my name during a game. He'd be wow. like, and if you're wondering, you know, who made those masks that Nick Nurse is wearing all the time, it's Natty Lloyd amazing, and she's like, yeah. And check her out at Toronto or at NadiaLloyd.com. And, and so anyway, so that, was hap that happened for like a year and a half that, that my people, people were spotting the Raptors and, and uh, Mayor Tori wearing my face mask. But, but my, my Sportsnet feature aired to millions of people, right? So it was like game six. It was the game that they lost on first. Game six of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. They were playing the Celtics, if I remember well. Mm -hmm. So there were like, I don't know, 4 million people watching this NBA game all over the world. And then right in the middle of it during like, I, don't know, I know it's not called intermission, but I don't know my basketball terms. During a break from the game, they played that feature to millions of people. And it was like watching, watching myself being interviewed during an NBA game was like... Yeah, that's <sighs> amazing. I know. All your hard work finally <laughs> paid off. <laughs> <laughs> The biggest explosion of, you know, just yeah. the biggest out of body experience I've ever felt. That's amazing. It was wild. Uh, how was your, was your your son? Must have been very excited today. So is he, he a Raptors he, fan? He was. Um, so him and I were we're not sporty people, but uh. we definitely became Raptors fans during <laughs> all of that, right? And long story short, because I want I don't want to forget to mention this, but I we raised twenty two thousand dollars for amazing. For, um, thank you for your, thank you for thank you for doing that, Nadia. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. There's so many, yeah. There's there's just so many things like uh, that I wanna I wanna talk to you about about this, but yeah, this this is great. Like you just kind of navigated through your way through all of this, and, and then then you did the BLM. I, I mean, what like what like what did you learn from all of this? Um, I learned to uh, trust the universe, to trust myself, to follow my instinct that it will always lead me to the next move, my next move, mm -hmm. my next step, um, to enjoy life and to realize how magical and precious it is. And, uh, and also to, because during, during that year and a half, like I can't even tell you the amount of emails I got from people, especially like after the sports net mm -hmm. 
feature people like hundreds of emails sometimes hundreds a day of people saying your story is so inspiring you've helped me do this you know so um so that's why i love to do things like this to be even though i'm an introvert and i like to hide in my cave like i realize the importance of me sharing my journey and sharing my resources and my tricks to help encourage others who may be feeling stuck and maybe feeling unmotivated and scared and but wanting more out of life right mm -hmm. like i i feel like it's it's my duty to share this journey so even if they walk away with just one they remember one thing that i said today and it helps them get closer to whatever their goal is then i feel good because i tell people all the time do what you can with what you have when it comes to helping others it's not about you know i don't have enough money or i don't have enough resources or i don't know enough people no it's like look around at what you have and start from there and that's how the face mask came to be right i was just recycling cushion covers mm -hmm. and i have sewing skills bam i put the two together and look at what happened right so absolutely no that's great uh so nadia if if, if you were to go back one of the questions i ask to all to all my audience, if you were to go back 10 years ago, what would you tell 10 year younger Nadia? It's mm, a really good question. Would you do anything differently or? No, I would say have fun, enjoy the process, stay positive, count your blessings daily. That's yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> I know it was simple, but it's very effective. Yeah. Um, I try to, like, as I'm getting older, Nadia, I'm, I'm figuring out things like simple things matter so much. Like things you mentioned before, like self, self care, like, you know, going for a walk, eating well, like these things matter so much because it, it kind of spreads into other areas of your life. If you're, it sets the foundation. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, so it, we, we talked about all the successes that you've had, Nadia. I want to talk about some challenges. Uh, can you maybe share some examples of challenges that you have had and how you kind of overcame them and how what helped you um, sure. go through them? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, financial challenges. Mm -hmm. um, single mom living in Toronto, it's not cheap. It's not it's not an easy task to accomplish, right? Self-employed. Mm -hmm. um, so asking for help when I needed it, and uh, but but trusting that eventually I wouldn't, because. Um, you know, one thing I've learned is like when you have financial stresses and worries, it, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like that thunderstorm that never leaves you. Even if it's sunny outside, you still have all that stress and anxiety and worry. Mm -hmm. um, having to navigate learning to be a single mom, a mom, I'm, you know, um, and self-employed again. It's your mom was self-employed. No, me. Oh, you were self-employed. Okay. Me was, yeah. you know, I didn't have like the a steady schedule or a steady income mm -hmm. and um and you know sometimes with with my my uh ex-husband being military sometimes he's he'd be he'd find out like today by the way i'm gone for three months starting tomorrow oh wow yeah right so it's like okay you know so having to just learn to navigate that and and build a village around me that could help me and asking for help when i needed it um and also, I would say one thing that took my life on a different course in the last 10 years is also um, recognizing who to make a mentor and who not to, right? So spending time with people I admired. What do you look for when you look for a mentor? Um, number one, integrity. Integrity is like my big thing is, 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 is you have to be true to who you are um, and be kind and loving like you can't be stepping over people on your quest to get to where you're going so and you can you can be both you can be kind loving and still live with integrity honesty sincerity um not being able not being scared to speak your needs setting boundaries all of that right and so i have like a couple of friends in my life one in particular her name is marnie she's been my friend for 17 years and like i've learned so much from her because she she lives that way mm -hmm. and and um and attracts so many great things in her life and has so much abundance and so watching her and kind of kind of wanting to be more like her and and learning to and and just spending time with her and learning and, and seeing how she lives like it, her true core self and applying those new skills to my life has made a big difference too so 
so my advice is just, yeah, have like one or two people that you admire, you know, spend some time with them and, and ponder what is it that you like about them? What is it about their lives that you'd like to see in yours? And, uh, you know, when you, when you figure it out, then you can put, put in the work, self-development, mm -hmm. put in the work to try to live that lifestyle and see what happens. Right. Um, so yeah. And it's, it's great because she says that she's learned so much from me in the last 20 years. And I'm like, really? Like how awesome what, what is, is she, that? What does she do? Sounds like an amazing person. Yeah. So she's a life coach <laughs> oh, by she? profession. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> she's a life coach, but you know, she says that I've taught her you know the the go getter in me the fire the don't um don't don't you don't have to wait until everything's perfect to launch that business because it will never be perfect so do a little bit every day like she's just says to me like you just you you you're you, one day you're an artist next thing you know you're winning now magazine best toronto artist 2021 2022 then the raptors are wearing it's like who are you? You keep reinventing. Yeah. She's known me 20 years, right? So she's like, you keep reinventing yeah. yourself and, and, and what you do is... It is true. Like, you do so many different things and you're <laughs> successful at everything. Like So she's like, you, you know, like, she says she's more hesitant when it comes to making decisions or taking actions. And so seeing me just, like, plow through um, what I do is giving her the courage to, to get in permission. Yeah, absolutely. To give it a go. Well, in full disclosure, it's also giving me courage. Right yeah. <laughs> See that, that to me is a Sunday well spent. Let's see. Um, well spent. What, what, what do you, what do you work? What's next for Nadia? What are you working on right now? So right now, um, you know, I had, I had like, you know, you, you've heard of the 15 minutes of fame. Mm -hmm. I've had like, I had like the 15 months of fame. Yeah. <laughs> And the adrenaline was crazy. And I worked like 18 hours a day for 18 months. So, so in full disclosure, I'm resting. I'm resting a lot. And I've been resting for a year. And I'm finding that I still need to keep resting a little longer. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on my events. I have five more events uh, coming up this year. So I run a company called Toronto Art Crawl. Mm -hmm. And I run large-scale art exhibits featuring other artists. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's usually between 70 to 170 artists. So these are oh, big wow. scale. What's the, uh, is it like just painters or photographers as well? or It's anything um, handmade. Toronto artists? Toronto oh, anything art, handmade. Toronto art crawl. So yeah. no photo like Yeah, so, yeah? So, so anything that, that's not like... Um, like digitally produced? No, digitally produced, but your art, your photography, yeah, okay, gotcha. right? How, what's the application process? So um, so you go on the website, yeah. torontoartcrawl.com. Toronto Art okay. Yeah. And then uh, the application will ask you what products uh, would you like to sell? So that's where you tell me if you're a, a painter, if you're a photographer, if you're a sculptor, if you're a jewelry maker, if you're a fashion designer, if you do woodwork, if you do metalwork, if you do candles, whatever it is that you do. Um, like artisanal or art that you want to sell. Mm -hmm. So that's how you apply. You just cl uh, fill out the application based on that information. And this is like, I've heard of this. Like, is this every year? So every year I do between five and seven events. Mm -hmm. um, and this is my 10th year. So I started this company in 2013. And it started because one day I thought, hey, it'd be kind of fun to gather my artist friends and do a little art show in Liberty Village. Because every time somebody would say, where do you live? And I'd say Liberty Village. And I'd be like, oh, that's such a creative place. And I was like, yeah, but no. Like, there's no art shows or nothing, nothing. So I thought, I'm just going to run a little art show in the park. And um, so I came up with the idea April 30th, which is today. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. It is today. Yeah. Mind blown. So today, 10 years ago, I had this little idea <laughs> of let's run a little art show. And the first one was uh, June 10th. So the art show was six weeks away or five weeks away. And by June, I had 45 artists who joined. And, we, and then I had hired a DJ and had food trucks. And we, we ran the day. So it's like an outdoor exhibit. And it was so much fun that at the end of the day, I decided I want to do this again. So this June 10th coming up, will be is my 10th anniversary wow so it's happening at the bentway okay the bentway is that gorgeous venue space under the gardener across from the yeah i know i know what center. You like. have you already chosen all the artists for this year no so i'm still accepting i oh, have okay. 120 so far i'm, I'm probably gonna get like 40 more in the so how, how do they display like is it like a, you give them a bo or like a small i give them something? a space so they choose how much space they want okay and then they come and they outfit they their space the okay. so they create like a little shop a pop-up mm. shop for the nice. day yeah. So yeah. So I do five to seven of those a you day. You do that this year? Yeah, I've done two already. I did one. I did one called the Urban Exhibit in February. I did okay. my second one called the Spring Pop Up uh, 
16th of April, so two weeks ago. The next one is in June, after that's September, and then I do two really big Christmas markets. One in November, one in uh, That must in keep December. you really busy. Like, it does, yeah. it does. And so, so that's where my, creati- my creativity and my time is going primarily right now is with these art shows because um, I take that responsibility very seriously because I represent a hundred plus artists. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I get so much uh, gratification out of, you know, standing at the center of my venue and seeing thousands of people uh, walk around me who came out to shop to support the local art. Um, and I have that little moment at every event. I make a point of like at one point. So, so in June I'll, I'll be at the Liberty village art crawl. I'm expecting 6,000 shoppers to come out. Wow. I have a wine garden, a cocktail garden. I have food vendors. I have a DJ. I might have some live music at one end of the venue. Um, so I, I know that, that I'll have that moment again where I'm just standing there and people are walking past me, like hundreds of people are walking past me. No one has any clue that all of this came out of <laughs> my head. head. <laughs> yeah. And I just get to like, be like, wow, look at all these people. Great feeling, and, eh? yeah, yeah. Because also it's a great feeling for so many reasons, but one of them is I go home and I, in my head I go, okay, if I had a hundred artists and the average is you know, the average artist made, let's say, $1,000 in sales that day, then my event generated $100,000. Yeah. Did I do the math right? Yeah, yeah. You did, yeah. 100 <laughs> artists, $1,000 a year. Right? Yeah, yeah. And that's like, whoa, that's, that's yeah, pretty, no, that's, great. that's pretty wild, right? Yeah. It's a good feeling to yeah, be able to facilitate other artists to succeed. I'm going to definitely, uh, I think I've been to your events. I just didn't know that you were the one who created them. But I'm definitely going to go this year. Awesome. Um, So last question that I ask all my audience, what makes you happy? Everything we talked about today makes me happy. Um, So what makes me happy is is, um, being of service. Being of service to others makes me happy because it makes me feel even though I, I'm an introvert and I like to hide in my cave and be left alone, the majority of the time, it makes me feel good to be a part of something bigger than me, right? So um, I, it makes me happy that my art makes people happy, and I hear that feedback all the time. People will send me f- a photo of like a woman walking, uh, crossing the street, holding my tote bag. Hey, Nadia, check it out, you know? Or at a Jays game, like I got pictures of people in my hoodies, that kind of stuff. That mm-hmm. makes me happy. Makes me, I'm happy that my art makes other people happy because it's um, so g- giving to me in an unlimited way. Like, it just gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. And, um, and I'm happy to be able to live life uh, it, on my own terms. You know, we talked about no boss, mm-hmm. um, no schedule except for my son, I'm free to do what I want, when I want, how I want, who I want. And it's, uh, that is like a core value to me is freedom. And it's that freedom that allows me to do everything else that I do. So it's, it's all in balance, right? So if I lose in one area, then you'll see it in another area. So I try to keep things very much like freedom, independence, flexibility of schedule, flexibility to work on the things I want to work on, keep making my kid my priority. Self-care. Self-care. I guess that encompasses all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, uh, yeah, that's great, Nadia. Thank you so much again for sharing your story with us. My it's pleasure. very inspiring. I, um, I, I, like, you know, I, always get, I always get scared when I take on a new endeavor, but hearing stories like yours is really inspiring. Like we, we, me and my friend, like, uh, we always talk about doing so many different things because we love music, we love talking to people, we love art, and we, we, like, you know, we're just like, how do we get it? But it's just so many, it just, we overthink, I think. Yeah, I think it's we overthink, but uh, we yeah. So do. hearing your story is very inspiring. But don't forget too that people need us creatives to create, wh- whether it's like a, a cool sweater, or a podcast that will inspire others, right? Like they, we're, we need to create. To, you need to share your creativity. You owe it to share your creativity because it will help someone in some way, or, yeah. or just brighten their day in yeah. some way. So it's important to keep going. Absolutely. You mentioned art creates, or I have to say, like the proper term would be art creates art, art begets art. Or, or like, yeah, the more I create, the more, the more I create. Yes, the more I create, the more I create. That could be that. That's going to be the motto of the video. But uh, thank you very much, Nadia. Oh my God, my pleasure. Thanks for giving me a platform to <laughs> Absolutely. share. Absolutely. Thank you.